Hello and welcome back. I'm Rahul Gosain here as always with my brother and co-host Rohit Gosain on the Oncology Brothers podcast. In our ongoing series of challenging cases, where we dive into real life cases where often the question is, what next? Today, we're focusing on relapse refractory AML with FLT3 mutations. For this, we're thrilled to have two leukemia specialists, Dr. Uma Barade from Ohio State University and Dr. Navo Davar from MD Anderson Cancer Center. Navo, Uma, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us. Before we dive into our cases, it is important to reiterate what is the current standard of care. For leukemia patients, how we divide them is fit versus unfit. If there is a fit presentation, then we'll see if there is FLT3 positive case or not. And then in that case, patient would undergo 7 plus 3 induction with mitostorin or quasartinib, approved options there, followed by transplant. And if not transplant, then maintenance therapy with these FLT3 positive therapies. For unfit patients, HMA with venetoclax is usually the standard of care. While the practice has been differing in this case, whether one would rely on single agent versus doublet or even triplet, then in relapsed refractory settings, giltritinib is the only approved option for FLT3 mutated AML. Focus on today's talk is cases from the community, particularly in relapsed refractory FLT3 positive disease. Clinical trials are always the right answer, but at least from community standpoint, outside of clinical trials, what is the current standard of practice? Diving into our first case, a fit 47-year-old woman with worsening fatigue, anemia, thrombocytopenia, and leukocytosis with white blood cell count of 73,000 with significant myeloblasts. On bone marrow, one was, this patient was found to be FLT3 positive for ITD. Treatment was 7 plus 3 with mitostorin, underwent transplant, and was being was monitored on surveillance. She relapsed at 14 months, and then repeat PCR confirmed FLT3 positive ITD. Now, well, we'll start off with you here. Could you please touch on the testing of FLT3? Can this be easily done on peripheral blood via NGS, or you rely on bone marrow? And importance of allele frequency here. What is the treatment paradigm for you? Thank you, Roy. It's very important to highlight that the testing must be done at the time of relapse. You cannot depend on the baseline molecular mutation to make decisions at relapse. Data has been published by many groups now showing that you can lose FLT3 in up to 50% of patients after wow. having intensive chemo FLT3 inhibitor. So yes, the first thing is you want to test. The second is what do you test on? In general, at relapse, we do get a bone marrow for most of our patients. So we would do the testing NGS on the bone marrow. Now, if you have a patient who's very sick and they're in the ICU, severe leukocytosis, it is fine to send the peripheral blood if you have a lot of circulating blast. It's probably a reasonable option. There are two major ways that FLT3 testing is being done in the US. So one is next generation sequencing, NGS, and the other is PCR. We usually will send the PCR first because that comes back in about 48 hours. The NGS panel, which includes many other genes, may come back six to seven days later. That's our approach to testing in relapse. At this point, I would say the standard, the approved agent in this setting for relapse FLT3 mutation patient, either ITD or TKD is giltritinib. Now, that being said, we have done various combinations with either venetoclax or chimene, or even with chemo. These have been published in various settings. So Again, as you said, trial is the right option. I really would try to get this patient on trial. We do have many such trials. But if I could not get a trial and the patient is young, 47, my goal is to consider, and this is another tricky area, if I'm considering a second transplant, which some centers do, I would probably go for a combination either with VEN or with chemo, get the transplant team ready, try to proceed with transplant, and maybe do maintenance this time. It would not be unreasonable for Aguirre alone. The response rate, though, is a little lower than what we have seen with combos, about 40-50%. So if it's a short period treatment with a goal to bridge to transplant, I'm quite comfortable to do a VEN or HMA VEN plus combo, get a higher response rate. Counts may not recover, but I'm okay with that as I'm going to transplant. So, Uma, when it comes to relapse post-transplant FLT3 mutated AML, we all know that it carries poor prognosis, with ITD being more common and aggressive, whereas TKD is less common, but usually a little more favorable. Coming back to this patient in your practice, outside clinical trials, what treatment options are we relying on? What data do we have to support that? I agree with Naval. I would reach for giltritinib first. Monotherapy as the easiest thing to get in the FDA-approved setting. I have found that combining giltritinib with venetoclax gives you much faster responses, 
but it definitely creates a situation where the patient has profound cytopenias, their marrow responds quickly, the blasts go away, but so do some of the normal counts. Recovery can be challenging. But in a situation where the patient has relapsed, they're proliferative, we really want to get disease control quickly. So in the community setting, I think if you can get giltritinib fairly in a straightforward manner, and if you can get venetoclax on top of that as combination, that's great. But even if you can get monotherapy, giltritinib, that would be wonderful. A couple of things to note when you're doing monotherapy with giltritinib, QTC is definitely something to monitor. A lot of our patients are on other drugs that can interact with giltritinib. With azoles, there's not necessarily a recommended dose reduction, uh-huh. but you have to be cautious with QTC and other things, especially if patients have you know cardiac history as well. We'll dive into the side effect profile with QTC, transaminitis, and differentiation syndrome shortly, Uma. Going back to you again, Rahul, what you reiterated was ITD and TKD mutations is uh-huh. where giltritinib was approved. Based, and this is based off of Admiral trial. Giltritinib approval was based on improved OS compared to salvage chemotherapy. Complete remission is somewhere about 20 to 25%. Uma, if one was to ha- be on maintenance therapy, FLT3 inhibitor initially, and here the disease was to be re- refractory. What are your treatment options here, at least from the standard of care standpoint? To reiterate the question, if this patient was on FLT3 maintenance therapy after their transplant in probably giltritinib, then if the patient were to relapse on maintenance therapy, what could we do in this situation? I think that's a tough one, obviously, because now their disease has seen giltritinib. I would then very strongly favor combining giltritinib with venetoclax. I think we've seen data as well as anecdotally that the combination is far more efficacious than single-agent giltritinib alone. I think, as Naval mentioned, you could do a triplet where you could Mm -hmm. add an HMA like azacitidine to venetoclax and giltritinib. Obviously, the cytopenias are far more profound in that situation. Indeed. Mm -hmm. And with regards to the QTC prolongation novel, as Uma was talking about this, we also worry about the differentiation syndrome, transaminitis, any important clinical pearls or side effects that one should keep in mind here? Giltritinib is a very safe drug, very well tolerated in general. The main things we've seen are GI. You can see some diarrhea, nausea, taste change, LFT changes are not uncommon, usually grade one, two. If they're higher, then maybe interrupt for a few days and restart. Uh, We have not seen major QT prolongation as an issue with giltritinib. It is seen more with a partner, other FLT3 inhibitor called quizartinib. It's a little bit more important to monitor there with quizartinib. And I think it's a very potent drug. It's extremely well tolerated from a patient perspective. The lack of GI side effects and the odd taste known with mitostorin. Patients really like quizartinib. I think safety-wise, very good. The QT issue is not a huge issue at the doses that it's approved and can be overcome. So we are using much more quizartinib for our ITDs up front. We don't see much clinical differentiation syndrome with the FLT3 inhibitors. There is hematological differentiation on the bone marrows and labs, but unlike the IDH inhibitors or the menin inhibitors, true clinical DS is not a problem. While we're on the topic of side effects, Naval, Uma, you both brought up neutropenia or some sort of marrow suppression here. Uma, when it comes to marrow suppression and AML, it's always frowned upon to consider growth factors. We're talking about combination with venetoclax and gilteritinib. There's more cytopenia here. Is there any role of growth factors in these patients or are you relying on lower dose or taking some time off from these medications? Yeah, I think that's a great question. When we all were training in fellowship, growth factor use was frowned upon because there was this, you know, myth or or not necessarily myth, but this thought process out there that you would inadvertently stimulate the leukemic blast. But now with azacytidine, venetoclax, and the triplet combinations, we are much more comfortable once we do a bone marrow biopsy that assesses the blasts are less than 5%, and we're quite comfortable that the leukemic burden has gone that using growth factors to help normal hematopoiesis return is now, I think, much more accepted practice in the AML field. I think there was a really nice analysis by Keith Pratt and the VLAA team showing that growth factor use 
in the alley A with ASA then treatment after a bone marrow biopsy showing blast less than 5% was safe and did not impact outcomes. This gives us more confidence to use growth factor support as long as the restaging bone marrow biopsy mm -hmm. shows the leukemia is controlled. Absolutely. In this particular case, the patient did indeed get gelturitinib and the dose had to be reduced, but then tolerated it rather well. All right, now let's touch on our second case where we have an 80-year-old with FLT3 TKD positive AML, unfit for induction due to heart failure and diabetes. Novel, he received azacitidine with venetoclax upfront, partial response, but then nine months in, the disease started to progress. Repeat PCR confirmed FLT3 TKD again. What are our options? Gilteritinib monotherapy? Would you combine this with HMA venetoclax? Or in someone like this, would you have started off with gilteritinib and ASA upfront? Yeah, this is a great case. So, you know, the TKDs are very tricky, especially in this older population. So, first of all, for ITD, I would feel much more strongly of doing ASA and GILT. And, you know, we have data now published in JCO. There's a larger study called the Viceroy that many investigators are part of. But I think in the ITD, ASA has pretty suboptimal outcome responses. Survival is 9.910 months is what was published in the subset analysis by Dan Polier from the Viale A. We are seeing the triplet is definitely improving duration of response OS, and I think we should be thinking about that. For TKD now, is event does pretty well. The survival is around 20 months. Response rates are good. Now, maybe the, the triplet will improve on the doublet beyond that, but I don't think it's as imperative, especially in the 80-year-old, where you're going to get added myelosuppression. So I think starting here with a doublet, is a then is reasonable. And if the patient, you know, gets two, three-year remission, that is great, which you may see with the TKDs with ASA then. And at relapse, then what do you do? I think here, giltritinib alone may be a good option. You were looking at somebody who's going to be 80 plus, frail, complications are high. We're not thinking about a curative intent to transplant, maybe more palliative. So we've done a couple of strategies. We've either just gone with giltritinib alone in this setting, about a 40, 45% overall response, CR, CRI combined. Or we may say, let's do one cycle of then maybe 10 to 14 days with gilt, trying to get an early response and then go to gilt alone. But yeah, I think giltritinib either alone or maybe one cycle with a then may be a reasonable option to try to get back in remission without too much myelosuppression and toxicity. Puma, with regards to HMA agents, would you say you tend to rely more on decitabine or azacitidine here? I'm much more an azacitidine girl, <laughs> I think, because there's so much data with mm -hmm. aza, ven, and the triplet combinations in terms of triplets. I definitely favor azacitidine. I would say with the case that you're talking about, I completely agree. You can start off with guilt and ven and then drop the ven once you have a response. I'm not sure how much an HMA would add in this situation since the patient's been getting HMA then and then relapsed on it. I think we can get really good efficacy with guilt or guilt with Ben. So I think trying to do that as opposed to a triplet in an 80-year-old might probably be my preference. No, well, decidabine or azacitidine? Like... We're not married to either. As everybody <laughs> knows, we were one of the lead sites and we like aza as well. I think what we are leaning more towards is oral therapy. Mm -hmm. and, and that is where Indeed. I think the cytobine has the right. higher, earlier data to get it used because we have oral DAC, which is now approved in MDS, and it has 99% bioequivalence at ASCO. Last month, there was data shown with oral decidabine with oral venetoclax or oral doublet, as they're calling it, almost exactly similar PK equivalents, good response rates, survival 16, 18 months, looking very similar to Viale. So, of course, we and the patients like the oral. That is why I think we have moved a lot of our combos and trials with triplets to oral. So, oral triplets, you know, oral DAC, oral VEN with a FLT3 or MEN in IDH sounds very attractive and patients like it and moving into the futuristic realm of treatment. That being said, there is an oral azacitidine also coming from the same company. So when that comes, we will have to reevaluate. For IV, honestly, I will say it doesn't matter at all. Absolutely. And especially for us out in the community settings, when we have patients in rural settings, that oral, though you still have to monitor this very closely, just that convenience plays a big role. Uma, we're often talking about supportive care out in the community settings. Prophylactic antibiotics play a big role here. But when it comes to monotherapy, gilteritinib, or when you're adding this with doublet, venetoclax, or your HMA, can you touch a little around the utility of prophylactic antibiotics when we're using FLT3 inhibitors? 
I would say we always err on the side of caution. We anticipate these patients, especially in the relapsed refractory setting, to be neutropenic for prolonged periods of time. So I think generally we are on the side of caution in doing all three. So I think we, as standard, do antiviral prophylaxis with you know an antiviral agent, acyclovir, 800 milligrams daily. We also do standard antibacterial prophylaxis. Our drug of choice is Levaquin, 500 milligrams daily as prophylaxis. And then I think the azole it needs to be broad spectrum, but the specifics, whether it's posaconazole versus voriconazole, depends on the patient's insurance. And I think the thing to keep in mind is depending on the azole that you choose, you do have to adjust the venetoclax if that's part of your relapsed refractory strategy. Indeed. Now, well, before we close, any final thoughts for us in the community settings? Yeah, I think with the triplets, there's a lot of excitement in the community. One has to be very careful because the doses are quite modified. So if one is doing it, it's not just let's add 21, 28 days of N and guilt. So if you're going to do it, I think important to either look at the papers closely or coordinate with a clinical trial or if the patient is able to go on one of the frontline trial. That will be even better because then we can actually get more mature data. But other than that, I mean, you know, FLIT3 is probably one of the groups where we've had the maximum improvement compared to 20 years ago, where survival was 20%. It was adverse. Today, we're up to maybe 60, 65 for fit young patients, and it's intermediate, maybe even favorable with some of the co-occurring NPM1. So it is what we hope to achieve with menin inhibitors and other drugs in the future. Uma, as we close, any additional thoughts? No, I think we covered everything. I would just maybe add to post-transplant maintenance. I can very well see, you know, patient comes to us, we induce the patient, patient goes to transplant, patients on post-transplant maintenance, but they're now being managed in the community on giltritinib. So just being familiar with the challenges and side effects that we talked about with giltritinib, knowing again that it's pretty well tolerated and then monitoring for relapse. And I think you guys did a fantastic job of all the different scenarios of how this patient could relapse and what our options are. But I think a lot of our community physicians are really seeing the best case scenario that Naval referred to where we're doing well with these split three you know, mutated patients. They've undergone transplant and now they're on maintenance guilt or maintenance quizartinib familiarizing yourselves with kind of those agents and the drug-drug interactions, monitoring. And the last thing I just wanted to add, you are going to be encountering a lot of people on maintenance quizartinib in the community, and there is a REMS program in place currently. I don't know how long that will continue to be prescribing quizartinib. You do have to be signed up for the REMS program. And in 2025, the REMS program is a moving target. Uma right. Nabo, thank you so much for walking us through your treatment options for these challenging cases that we continue to see in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. For our listeners, let's do a quick recap from today's discussion. In today's challenging case episode with Dr. Naval Duffer and Dr. Uma Barate, we focused on relapse refractory FLIT3 mutated AML through two real-life cases. For our first post-transplant, relapse gilteritinib monotherapy is a standard option for FLIT3 ITD or TKD mutations based off significant survival benefit, though we have to keep side effects in mind that come along with this intervention. For our unfit patient progressing on aza venetoclax combination, gilteritinib monotherapy, or in combination with hypomethylating agents up front can provide a potential treatment option, but again, cytopenias, differentiation syndrome, transaminitis are few things to keep in mind. Testing up front and also retesting at the time of relapse disease for these mutations is extremely important. Thanks so much for tuning into this series. If you are enjoying this series and would like to share a challenging case from your own practice, reach out to us at info at onkbrothers.com. Continue to follow us along for more discussions on the latest in cancer care. We are the Oncology Brothers.